Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of Noise Floor. Thank you for joining us. If you had a good evening last night in various Afghan restaurants or wherever you ended up. <laughs> um, so we're starting today with our paper session. We have two speakers this morning. And our first speaker is David Cotter. David Cotter is a guitarist and a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge. And David will be talking to us today about the collaborative guitar. Thank you. Great, thanks Mark. Yes, uh, today I'd just like to give a bit of a potted history of what I call the collaborative turn, leading to the collaborative zeitgeist of the 21st century, looking a bit at the collaborative piano, and then forwarding the notion of what we might call uh, the collaborative guitar. So in very broad terms, what we kind of have over the last 200 years could be conceived uh, as an extended gestation period of uh, collaboration or towards collaboration, where there's been a philosophical shift away from the notion of the autonomous individual, imagine composer with a direct line, from them to God. This kind of thinking has been uh, overturned in many ways with a more sense of collective, mutual and shared agency. Uh, and we see this across many different, uh, many different uh, disciplines. Uh, so, for example, in child developmental studies, uh, Jean Piaget conceived as uh, of the, the tasks of human development taking place mainly al al alone, whereas Vygotsky kind of saw it more through terms of scaffolding that the child and their development is molded through interaction with the social world. We also see now that the psychoanalytical psychologists, Freud, Jung, even their work is being critiqued for having too much of a focus on the autonomous individual psyche without taking into account the role of a community. So we're moving towards a place where we regard the individual as molded by interaction with the social world. We could call this a collaborative Term. And we can reasonably regard this as a manifestation of our burgeoning understanding of the total relationality of the human experience. We could have put the, the cooperative term or, or another word, so uh, similar <laughs> usage, um, but collaborative is the one that's really kind of taken uh, taken track. And uh, we see it's quite a quite a late phenomenon. It, uh, although the first usage of the term is 1860s, uh, it wasn't until the 1950s that it really uh, proliferated. And we get to the point today where the term is used as a marketing tool. If you look at the, the, uh, the mission statements of Google, Facebook, GitHub, Airbnb, any of them, they all use the word uh, collaborative or collaboration in terms of what they stand for and what they aim to do. However, it's not a purely positive phenomenon, as all phenomena might be construed. Um, Mine Duantan Dak has written of the social construction of an ideology of collaboration, which promotes, among other things, the view that collaborating is always better than not collaborating and should be encouraged continuously. Um, and obviously, this is something uh, which could be cause for concern. Uh, there is, in a lot of contexts, uh, being forced to always uh, work together can lead to what we might call groupthink, as we can see in this little cartoon here, where people are allow a consensus to emerge and move forward with that, even if it's not what anyone actually really does value as the best way, best way forward. However, scholars such as Zolman have reconciled that although collaboration almost always comes with a cost, uh, we must weigh these things and the extent to which specific collaboration is helpful or harmful depends how we weigh those costs and benefits. So there's a score which reflects part of a project that I worked on with Mark over the last uh, couple of years, and that was a good example of, a, of an artistic collaboration where both of us through that project achieved, which maybe neither of us would have been able to achieve or would have achieved uh, if working alone. This definition is quite a, quite a useful, useful one, and kind of sums up why we might use this term instead of uh, instead of interaction, instead of cooperation. Um, and that is that collaboration involves an intricate blending of skills, temperaments, effort, and sometimes personalities to realize a shared vision of something new and useful. So it's something which has one foot in the past and one foot moving forward. 
Now we see this collaborative turn also uh, emerging within musical performance. Um, if we go back to the 18th and 19th centuries, many art songs were conceived of as duos. There were many sonatas which we conceived for piano and violin, or piano and guitar. And now we just know them as Mozart's violin sonata. So there's this total flip in the way that we conceive a lot of these works. Partly that's due to increased theatricality of soloists, whereas pianists, the piano, the collaborative instrument par excellence, at least in the Western classical tradition, forced performers to sit perpendicularly to their performers, taking very much a backwards step. Uh, Susan Tones points out that the downgrading of pianists to accompanists would shock the composers. And Sir Herbert Hamilton Harty, uh, what a wonderful name, pointed out that of all the different parts of the piano playing, the one that has most been uh, consistently neglected is that of the art of accompaniment. But things are changing. Things are changing. Uh, the RCM in London became the first conservatoire to rename its Masters in Piano Accompaniment course as a course in collaborative piano in 2018. And there's been an exponential increase of other conservatoires institutions doing the same thing, across, uh, especially across the UK and uh, the USA. Gramophone uh, recently had an article entitled The Art of the Collaborative Pianist, uh, where they had Elizabeth Watts Soprano and Simon Lepper, pianist, agree that the time has come once and for all to leave this term accompanist behind. Of course, we could go even further. Uh, pianist Warren Jones prefers the term pianist just to accompanist and collaborative pianist. Um, that's an interesting ideological dehierarchization that we've got here. Probably goes a bit further than uh, my research, but it shows the way in which we are starting to begin about musicians and their roles within ensembles. It's um, interesting, I can just point here to the ways in which collaboration or collaborative courses are dealt with. Um, if you look at many of the prospectuses for these courses now, they expect collaborative pianists to have the same technical mastery almost as soloists, but there's also a, a focus on interpersonal skills, facility of, of tuning, of the transposition, of working with people. So there, there's a real focus on these kind of things now, which previously was left out of both pedagogical discourses and, and musical performance studies uh, discourses too. So within the Western classical tradition, the piano is kind of assumed as mantle here as this collaborative uh, instrument. If we were to go uh, and look at a Wigmore Hall programme for the year, um, we might see that most programmes have their soloist centre stage and piano accompanying uh, behind, faced perpendicularly, out of the way a bit. Um, but if we look more broadly outside of the Western classical tradition, um, the guitar is very much the collaborative instrument of the world in a, in a variety and a plethora uh, of contexts. And so it's interesting to see how it has that kind of identity in some contexts, but not in others. And this has very much been a kind of starting point for some of my research. Um, interesting, I'm interested to know about what the collaborative affordances of the instrument are, what, what people conceive of as the guitar's kind of cultural baggage, looking at the ways it has been used in collaborative contexts, the ways it's currently used in collaborative contexts, and the ways in which it could be used in collaborative contexts. So I did some ethnographic research, uh, which, is, which is still ongoing. I basically used my Facebook friends list as, as, as my as a sample, not all of them, but it was a good body of, of academics and musicians, uh, which uh, you know, I've, I've met or I've worked with over the years. And basically anyone who was a musician of any instrument, I, I asked them kindly if they wouldn't mind contributing to this. And we have 150 participants to date. Um, in 22 countries, so a nice big spread, and a number of eminent uh, musicians have kindly taken part in this. And a number of ideas uh, have emerged about what the guitar stands for. Um, Autodidacticism, exoticism, freedom, gender, intimacy, power. Um, you see there's a huge, huge amount of cultural baggage here. 
But it's also interesting to see that 37 of the participants wrote extensively about tradition and how the guitar has at least uh, is perceived as having such such a strong uh, tradition, which basically affects any uh, ensemble, any setting that it is based in. And from the this kind of early research, four basic strands emerged. Um, and this was the sonic affordances of the instrument, the spatial affordances, the cultural uh, affordances, we could call them, um, and the technological affordances of the instrument. These are the things which have resulted in the guitar being what it is uh, today. <clears throat> so I might just go through very quickly here and uh, show some of the, the themes which have emerged. It sounds quite simple, but the instrument sound affects the context in which it is situated. But this is a constantly changing process. It's really to see how this has developed over, especially the last 200 years, the development of the six string guitar in about 1800. As the sound changes, the context in which the instrument is situated changes. So the first change, you'd have to wait about 100, 120 years. Torres, a famous luthier in Spain, came along and uh, made the, the instrument much louder. And that was what allowed players like Scovia to, to take the guitar onto the international stage. And we started seeing the, the guitar being used in a few more pieces, uh, seminal pieces of the 20th century. Since the electrification of the instrument, and especially in recent years, this proliferation of context in which it can be used has really, really uh, expanded. We also see that it can't, people can't help comparing the guitar as a collaborative instrument to the piano, partly because there is this strong tradition of the, the piano being this collaborative instrument par excellence in the Western classical tradition. People are always seemingly comparing the two. Uh, there's an interesting article in the Giulianiad of the 1830s. That was one of the first things to really shine light on this. It was called On the Comparative uh, Merits of the Pianoforte and the Guitar. And we see this continuing through today. Um, the guitar sound is moving in two very different directions. On, on the one hand, the voice of the guitar becomes ever louder. On the other hand, the classical guitars, traditional, it's kind of a cultural material culture, um, has a simple directness which appeals imme immensely in the sometimes somewhat dehumanized context of industrial society. And a performer such as Sean Shebe has really tapped into this recent album called Soft Loud and a series of performances um, where he basically begun playing small Renaissance Scottish ma ma manuscript arrangements to begin very delicate, brittle landscapes, um, and something which has a bit of a resurgence. Mia Kukano has talked about the poetics of soft sound today. Some composers are looking at how quiet we can go. Well, on the other hand, um, we're looking to see how loud we can get. And Shiba has been finishing his concerts playing right and music by Julia Wolfe using you know, massive amplifiers and systems and, 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 and bagpipe emulators and, and all the rest to really show these two sides of the instrument. As we touched upon uh, a little bit earlier, spatial treatment of the guitar continues to be affected by the sonic blueprint of the instrument. And there is, there is a dialectic which emerges between these two. As many people pointed out, and as it's widely known, the guitar is seen as a collaborative instrument because of its shape and size, because of its uh, easy portability. Um, but little attention has been given to what this actually affords performers during performance. And what it affords them is an omnidirectionality, which isn't necessarily available to a pianist or another performer. We see guitarists not having to, classical guitarists at least, not having to sit down and, and remain seated all the time now. There's a huge number of, of stands, of rests, of cushions, of straps, of all these kind of uh, materials which allow the guitarist to, to move around in performance space. And this has uh, big implications for salience landscaping 
it's not just a case of seeing the person in the accompanying role, but how that uh, really, really affects um, how we hear um, what they are doing and how we value what they are doing, both as a co-performer, but also as, as an audience member. Looking at the social aspects of the captive guitar, it is a pluralistic instrument. Steve Goss has done a lot of uh, research, a lot of talks uh, in this area, um, and therefore it's a very good vehicle for the exchange of ideas and techniques. It seems quite uh, an easy facilitator for, for breaking down traditions and breaking down boundaries, because it can move between blues and folk music and electronic music and classical music maybe in ways which other instruments can't move quite so easily. We see that the boundaries between the Apollonian strain of classical guitar and the Dionysian frenzy of the electric guitar are becoming increasingly blurred, as we see with Sean Shibe's work. And because of this, the collaborative guitar can access emergent audiences. Because of people's affiliation simulation with the instrument, when it is placed in certain new contexts, let's say it's placed within a, within a context such as the Wigmore Hall, where it's not always been seen in a collaborative context, it stands as an antithetical actor within a tradition. And many people pointed, uh, in, in the ethnography at least, to how this would allow them to engage with, with repertoires, which they wouldn't usually engage with because of the guitar being in that in that context and obviously when this is mediated when this is done well we hope that it moves towards a, a synthesis of a new repertoire and new audiences and just to finish on that final and fourth strand looking at the technological aspects of the collaborative guitar there's a rich tradition of guitarists using technological innovations to facilitate and enhance their collaborative performance. And this stems from the 1800s with uh, tripodium and, and mechanical ways of holding and, and, and facilitating collaborative performance. And we can follow this all the way up to today. Approaches to amplifying the instrument are ever improving, but approaches to highlighting or hiding these processes are underexplored. Um, amplification, maybe it's the primary reason why the classical guitar release is able to feature in so many contexts uh, today to, to varying, to varying uh, degrees of favourable reception. Sometimes I, I remember when Christopher Page came to a concert that I did where I was amplifying before the concert, he was not happy that I was in this beautiful chapel and I had my classical guitar amplified, but afterwards he sent me an email and he said it wasn't as bad as he thought. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, which I think, it, it, knowing him, I think that was him kind of saying, yeah, it, it, it just about worked. And this raises uh, interesting questions, especially when it comes to the visuals of showing the processes that are going on behind uh, should we hide all of these leads, all of these amps from the stage to preserve this traditional image of this folkloric, this, this acoustic instrument? Or should we just leave them there? Should we point towards them and say, hey, no, this is this is baggage of guitaring. This is this is part of the guitar scape. Now this this is what we do. We're gonna come here with our amps and with our leads. And if you don't like it, then 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 then. <laughs> So we see that the, uh, the guitar is at the vanguard of uh, technological innovation in the collaborative uh, context. Mark and I have been working together in, in this kind of domain, especially, especially during, during the lockdown, where we, were, we had the chance to explore latency and explore the ins and outs of collaborating whilst being 400 miles apart. And we were able to do this through a you know, manifold number of sound processing um, extensions and things really came to a head during this lockdown period and in terms of the guitar assuming this mantle as a collaborative instrument in the 21st century ensembles such as the virtual guitar orchestra brought together 200 guitarists from from 40 countries um, covering vast 
distance and temporal temporal distances. So that's that's really nothing. Uh, it's something we should take really really seriously. So yeah, I hope I've just given a quick potted history today of uh, collaboration in the twenty first century. Uh, what the collaborative guitar has been and currently is, and uh, what it might be. So thank you. And there are so many different types of guitars and so many different sort of contexts to play them in. Yes. It would have been. And they, they all have yeah. their own, you know, cultural baggage to put your phrase on it. Absolutely, absolutely. One, it would have been almost impossible to put down a constraint, to put a definition of a guitar in the survey that enough practitioners would have been able to assimilate with, but also, also basically impossible because so many guitarists play so many different styles, they play so many different types of guitar. Uh, so for this, for these reasons, I just talked about the guitar. And then it was perfectly obvious when a guitarist was coming at the questions from an electric standpoint, they were then uh, given the opportunity to then develop what kind of guitarist they were. And each question was answered in response to the kind of guitar repertoire that they were talking about. Um, but I wasn't trying to set up the boundaries too, you know, too hard and fast because, because it's such a pluralistic instrument and because it, it, it's moving so quickly. But also it's interesting to see the differences between what we might call the Western classical tradition and other kind of musics. It's, it's not a set boundary. Um, so you can draw general conclusions, but generally we just want to see what, what the guitar is standing for and what it's capable of like, more generally. Okay. When you're talking about um, the guitar in your work, you're not specifically talking about the classical guitar, or are you? It's it, it, as, as in my kind of thesis, and yeah. my I usually define this paper to paper, depending on what I'm kind of talking about. I usually caveat uh, that I, I use the term classical guitar um, to define to define the the nylon strung instrument which is the one which is kind of kind of coming through in the western classical tradition if you use that term most people know straight away what you're what you're talking about so my research doesn't concern the electric guitar specifically it looks at the ways in which electric guitar performance can influence classical guitar performance but i allow classical to to include Acoustic to include finger style to include Spanish. Many people like to put the Spanish guitar. Yeah, I, I started playing the guitar as a very young teenager, and I started having lessons on the guitar. The only lessons I could have in the 1980s were classical guitar lessons, and that was my introduction yeah. to the classical guitar. And I found that the classical guitarists, I learned so much from doing the classical guitar, and I fell in love with it straight away. But the classical guitarists in the 1980s seem to be way more conservative, small c, than all the other guitarists I was using. And there seemed to be uh, a real, you know, clash. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how much that has changed, if at all. It's recent. Again, if we're going to talk about the Western classical tradition, um, guitar styles, electric guitar styles, pop, indie blues and whatever, has been more pluralistic for at least 70 years. The World College of Music being the first conservatoire to change its name was 2018. And, uh, <laughs> and that's with the piano and the guitar as a collaborative or as a solo instrument was only first entered the conservatoire proper in this country with John Williams, with Julian Green, Carl Spinell in the in about the 70s. So it just it doesn't have that tradition, so to speak, but it's catching up. It's really catching up in an exponential rate. That's it. Yeah, I think um, 
Sorry, yeah. sorry, I'm learning from Brazil. Uh, uh, in classic Italian, I think it's also South America. In Brazil, something in every single kid you have a classic Italian in the house, and you learn not the classic guitar, not the classic music, but actually popular music. Mm -hmm. so, so popular. It's that when you learn music, okay, classic guitar, so it'll give us piano. It's a good And you learn popular music, it's harder than. Um, yeah, I just wonder if you have numbers or your research, uh, how, how does it reflect in terms of outside the Western traditional culture, uh, classic guitar became like a um, popular instrument in terms, yeah, in the reflection about that. <laughs> uh, there is a composer, he is born in Switzerland, but he lived Brazil the whole life and died in Brazil, called a uh, very experimental composer, Walter Smetak. You have heard about him? Yeah, he was a professional member of Bahia and spent the whole life developing instruments, mm. exploring with glass guitar, with micro <laughs> So he has huge research, massive research about glass guitar and microtones. That's really very interesting about a lot of other aspects of glass guitar. Against, yeah. well, that would that would be that would be really really useful. Um, in terms of um, yeah, the number of guitars and, and households and, and everything, and why we haven't conceived of the instrument in certain ways, uh, that that's interesting. If we if we look at England, for example, at early eighteen hundreds, there were periods where every every household would have a guitar, but it was seen as a somewhat vulgar instrument. It was seen as an instrument. Of, of of the street, so um, when it came to to you know writing in the literature or conceiving of what we thought was a proper instrument uh, or a proper collaborative instrument, it just wasn't it wasn't really um, in included. Sadly, I mean there, there's huge peaks and troughs throughout that 19th century, decades where it was the instrument of the people, and then suddenly where it was the instrument of the upper classes, and the people stopped playing it. And then there were the Napoleonic Wars and uh, Spanish influence, and suddenly the guitar rose again. And then there were the, you know, the, the 19th century doldrums, where basically no one played the guitar for a while. So, you know, it's been, um, yeah, it's, it's been dispossessed at times, it's been forgotten about uh, at times, whereas. The piano is never, partly due to its cost, its size, its whatever, it's never had those negative uh, connotations. Any more questions for David from the floor? I, I've got just one more question for yeah. you. We've got another minute or so left. Let's just uh, indulge me, if you will. Mm -hmm. When we've been doing our collaborations with electronics, it's you and me and the computer over the internet. I wonder if you could just reflect on that, how, how, how you know, that works as a collaborative thing. Not specifically our collaboration, maybe, but just, just working with electronics and the guitar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, again, this is, a, this is a time where it's, it's difficult to, where we'd like to pigeonhole what type of guitar we're doing, because the electric guitar, obviously, from almost its conception, has been plugged in has been connected to other paraphernalia, where it's only very, very recently that we've started properly amplifying the acoustic instrument and allowing and having specialist uh, mics and pickups, which will allow me to plug in my made in Spain via Luthier, that kind of instrument mm -hmm. through into a sound card, you know, through Superfinder, uh, <laughs> Omnibus, or, you know, the, all the stuff, stuff that we use. Um, so the acoustic guitar is lagging behind the electric guitar in, 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 in that respect. Um, but but it's, uh, past that, it's, 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 it's not limited in terms of, uh, it's relatively easy to, to amplify as opposed to, let's say, I don't know, the bassoon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have oh, one more? more question? We'll, we'll, we'll take a minute. Uh, pedaling back to the beginning of your topic and that very uh, humorous image that you projected. Uh, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, my other half in writing your PhD on collaborative networks in contemporary dance came up with a very simple and obvious uh, concept, but I never heard anybody articulate before. So. If this is in the front end of your PhD, it could be useful. 
she uh, decided that there were two types of collaboration, collaboration through need and collaboration through desire. Uh, mm. And it's a step up from the former to the latter. So in just a simple example, in, in higher education, which is not what our whole thing was about, but it's just a very concrete example, <clears throat> you might have with your, your staff, with your students, with your line manager, whatever the system is, a collaboration through need. But when it's collaboration through desire, that's where a curriculum gets shit hot. Uh, and then there are people who want to devise uh, dance together, or devise music, or improvise music, whatever. Uh, collaboration through desire. And there, when you follow that through, uh, you can see structures that evolve, uh, and they bifurcate enormously. Yeah, incredible. Um, Thanks for that. If it, is, it, is it published? Was it, is it accessible? Well, the University of Chester, I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give it the name, I'll give it the title of and networks. And that, that simple concept, which is you know, not what it's about, but it's just so spot on because we keep talking about collaboration. Uh, but that's one. <laughs> Indeed. And what you guys are doing is another. Yeah. There are, I've seen that there are, there's intrinsic and extra extrinsic motivations for guitarists engaging in uh, collaborative practice. Um, intrinsic motivations being the ones, you know, creative types <laughs> wanting to plug in the instrument, wanting to, to drag it through rivers or whatever and see what is possible. Um, but also as an instrument which has often been a bit of an outsider in many different domains, especially the classical tradition one, um, by entering a new context, collaborative context, it is it is it is a source of revenue for many many musicians. Many people now rely on collaborative making, music making, to augment their what they originally set up to do was more of a purely solo kind of career. When we see conservatoires, <clears throat> for a couple of decades now, have been trying to help with chamber music training to kind of plug plug this gap. Um, and guitarists, as always, or classical guitarists, at least, were always just a little late to, to the party, but, but we're getting there. Great, good. Thank you. Can we thank the okay. Yeah, good to go. So our next speaker is um, Ben Hogg. Ben at the uh, Work with the Department of Music at Newcastle University. And Bennett's um, title of Bennett's paper is Lost Voices and Ghosts in the Machine Electroacoustic Voices as Tradition. Ghosts in Machines, plural. Oh, that's sorry. That's important, <laughs> as, as we'll see. Different, my own different machines, <laughs> different machines. Uh, thanks uh, for that, uh, uh, Martin. Thanks, David, for that. I've, I've got, I've got. Lots of interesting things I want to ask you about that. I didn't want to go into it right now, but yeah, the, the, the sort of private and the public and all of that. I love these kind of thresholds between, you know, the, the instruments that are designed. I love the clavichord, for example, you know, which you know you can't do a concert on the clavichord unless you amplify. Anyway, um, so Lost Voices, Ghosts and Machines, um, Electroacoustic Voices as Tradition. Um, I'm going to start just by playing um, the, the opening sequence of uh, an HTV, Hibernian TV production from 1977 called Children of the Stones. This is HTV. The sounds are important.
There's the hill. Deep bed tasmagorical, pretty hard. Deep bed tasmagorical, with an F, which means more fantastic than fantastic. <laughs> Rubbish, it's PH, as in phantasmagoria, a series of illusions or phantoms. A series of illusions or phantoms. Um, I just think that's a very nice way of thinking about the recorded voice in contemporary culture. And of course, recording of voices has been possible since 1878 or 1877, December 1877, Edison's invention of the phonograph. Um, as you'll hear, the beginning of the Children of the Stones uh, uses electroacoustic voices, voices that have been not terribly dramatically processed. They're more or less straight recordings, but you'll hear um, on some of them a great deal of reverb and a bit of filtering and stuff like that going on. And of course, this is ripped off YouTube, so it's not terribly good sound quality, but it wouldn't have been terribly good sound quality when it was broadcast in 1977. Uh, those of you who remember what tellies were like in 1977, speaker of FSB. Um, I'm just going to go back a little bit because for some reason, um, although I did set this up to be presenter view, it's of course changed since I just plugged it in. So let me just do that and go back. Good, there we are. Um, so I can see what I'm doing. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in are, are the, the, the unacknowledged, the unspoken or the unmade traditions of what a lot of us do, electroacoustic music. Um, we have the idea that, you know, there is a there is perhaps a linear tradition from from Pierre Schaffer uh, onwards or whatever. And I'm going to sort of problematize that because I, I, I don't always think it's terribly helpful to think in those ways about the nature of what a tradition is. So to quote uh, Joshua Clover, an American poet in his book, The Rose of the Name, he says, connecting a world of historical dots into a certain shape is like overlaying a constellation on a bunch of stars in the heavens. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a, a world of historical dots here. And I'm going to try and make a constellation out of them that might help us to think about the tradition we work in or the traditions we work in. And actually, uh, sort of mapping onto that, Julian Johnson, uh, the, the um, musicologist, uh, talks about Adorno's idea of the constellation. And he says, the challenge, uh, talking about uh, the, the, the argument between historical musicologists and analysts, and he's saying there shouldn't be an argument because good analysis doesn't make sense outside of a historical uh, understanding. And historical musicology, if it's not really talking about the stuff, uh, is also missing an opportunity. And he says the chat, he, he takes this challenge back to Adorno, who didn't believe in analysis as, a, as, a, as an independent uh, uh, practice. The challenge Adorno throws down may involve us in approaches to music that are messy, open ended, speculative, unverifiable, and vulnerable to dispute, in a word, unscientific. So, what I'm going to do is unscientific here. And with that in mind, they're going to play you another extract from uh, an early 1970s uh, TV programme. This wasn't made for children. Uh, this was a ghost story for Christmas one year uh, by, on BBC Two, 1972. And this is from, um, this is a, 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 a t television play, it's an hour and a half long, uh, called The Stone Tape. And briefly, if you don't know the, if you don't know the story, uh, the Stone Tape is uh, an electronics company have taken over a large stately home uh, in the country. It's been derelict for many years. The owner is a rather mysterious figure. And they uncover in the process of, of installing the recruit, they uncover a room which has got a staircase, a stone staircase going up the side that appears to lead nowhere and stops just short of the floor. And uh, the, the character played by Jane Ashton here uh, is... She's kind of psychic. Uh, she narrowly avoids a car accident in the very opening credits of the play because she sees two large lorries reversing into her, which actually are quite a long distance away from her. And she moves her car and they actually do collide. So she's got a sort of clairvoyance. She's sensitive to, um, uh, to, to uh, spiritual presences, if you like. But this is within an entirely male-dominated uh, environment of hard scientists. These are electronics people. These are people who are looking for rational explanations to everything. 
Uh, and we haven't got time to go into the, the, the gender politics of that, but it's 1972 and, and there we are. Um, so what this is, um, she, the people start hearing this woman screaming and footsteps running only in this room. And so they bring their equipment down to try and invest it, to try and capture a recording of this ghost. And uh, this short sequence is uh, the, first, um, the first time they attempt to do this. Uh, and as I say in the subtitle there, it also features the impulse response engineer from hell. As you'll see, the guy who's trying to get an impulse response, which I didn't realize they did this back in 1972, but that's what he's doing. He's taking an impulse response uh, from the room. And, uh, well, let's, let's just look at it. It was thought you just break a leg or something. Actually, go on the highway with Louise does. I am after Paul Louise. And then they paddled it over to hide it all. Big neck coming here, Steve. We've got a mess with it. Now, somebody make a loud noise with it. Yeah. What's all this? Put a chunk of it. Somebody make a feeling the ghost. Interesting one. I think I get my coat. Oh, I get my move. I'll spare us with it. What? What is that? This ghostly shivers. It's just chilly. Why don't you feel it? Oh, do you mind? What's that? All right, I'll take it. All right. Testing room wavelength, take one. Oh, stop it! All right, it's enough. Oh, oh, that was it. That was it. Well, the steps are covered. I'm not crazy, I'm not crazy. It wasn't loud. loud. It's just close. That's right. There's no perspective on it. What is she? I saw her. Again. Same place? No, there. White clothes. Solid? Yes, quite solid. Is she moving? I think so. There was something wrong, the way she moved. How? Sort of twisting. Let's hear it again. Stop it! Oh, stop it! Okay. Not there. Didn't look old. I got them on my headphones. I can't look at this. Can let me test this thing. She got away. So, the, the tape recorder can't record the sound of the ghost in the room. And it, as the show goes on, it transpires as a reason for that, because the receiver for the ghost's voice, the, the, the device that can decode what are basically the recordings of the to stone tape, the recording of this event is in the very stones of the building, and the device that we need to record it is human brain. So these people are all actually, that's why when they're arguing, they say, it was over there. No, it wasn't. It was really loud. No, I could only just hear it. It's in their heads, uh, but it's there. It is real. It's just not empirically real there. Again, I think this is another lovely image for what the voice is when it's inside uh, the world of recordings. Um, recording, of course, comes from the Latin recordare, which means to recall or to remember. Um, and because of that word and the usual translation of it, uh, we tend to think of recording as a kind of model of memory. Um, even though we now know that actually memories don't work like recordings at all, that's not what the brain does. It doesn't record things and play them back. It reassembles things from all sorts of data that it's taken in. Um, I actually think that recording has sort of blinded or maybe deafened us to another way of thinking about what a recorded voice in particular is. 
uh, and I've done a lot of, I've published quite a lot of things uh, and done some creative projects as well around this idea that actually recording is much closer to what we call metempsychosis or the transmigration of souls. And that when a device emits a voice or when a voice is uh, embedded inside of the device, it's like the device has acquired a kind of soul. And so the transmigration of souls is something we find in mythologies and actually in an awful lot of the early um, cultural imagination around uh, the voice coming out of a telephone, out of the radio, out of the phonogram. It's what my PhD was on. Uh, I was looking into various literary sources uh, and, and uh, sort of communications and stuff from the first half of the 20th century, uh, where clearly the model is much more that, that, that the voice is at least metonymically a being. It is an intelligence, it is a, a soul, if you like. Um, the two stories, The Children of the Stones and The Stone Tape, both feature loops in time. Uh, the Children of the Stones, once they enter that, in fact, it's Avebury Circle in, in Wiltshire, once they enter the circle, they're sort of doomed to keep repeating a particular day when um, the stones come back to life, but there are two stones missing. Uh, and they're trying to get the father and his son um, trapped and converted to form the final stones of the circle, which will unleash unimaginable power for the crazy guy, uh, played by the same actor in, in both series, actually, although it's a completely different story, uh, Ian Cuthbertson, um, the, for the crazy guy to sort of basically take over the world by getting unimaginable cosmic power through the stone circle once it's completed. Uh, and as the stone tape, as you see, is a room that plays back um, the most uh, traumatic event that's happened to. We discover as well that the stone tape really is a tape because they do something later in the programme uh, in which uh, the Jane Ashton character is actually killed by accident. And when they go back to try and close the room down, it's now her screen that's heard. It's erased the previous tape of poor Louisa uh, and the Jane Ashton character is now trapped in that loop. So this, the, the recording that takes things out of time, the recording that can loop time back upon itself is another thing uh, that's really foregrounded in these uh, stories. And obviously the parallels to what we used to be able to do with tape uh, and tape recording and tape loops, etc., uh, should be fairly apparent. I'm going to jump now though to another uh, large uh, ancient building. This is Cheeseburn Grange. Um, uh, it's a, a country house in Northumberland. Uh, it has extensive gardens uh, which are open six times, uh, six weekends of the year to the public to show, and artists are invited to come and show sculptures in them. I've been curating and making uh, sound uh, works, installations, and performances there since 2016. Um, we get, actually we're on hold for a couple of years, partly because of COVID and partly because we got too successful. Uh, the last uh, summer in six weekends, we had six and a half thousand people through. Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's a fairly large house. Uh, it's got fairly extensive grounds, but it can't really take that pressure of people. It became an extremely popular day out for people. <coughs> the place itself is currently um, cared for, as she likes to put it, by Joanna Riddle and her husband, Simon. Um, Joanna is a, a, a very keen uh, contemporary arts uh, collector and, and uh, expert. Um, the family, the house has never, ever been sold. It was, well, it was sold once. It used to be part of the monastery of Hexham in Northumberland. And after the dissolution of the monasteries, the Widrington family bought it and it stayed in that family or its uh, intermarried descendants ever since. So it, it's been more or less continuously occupied by the same people. The family are Catholic and have always been Catholic. They were part of what was called the recusancy, uh, the sort of Catholics who were denied political representation, they were denied public office, uh, they were very restricted in terms of what property they could own for a couple of hundred years. Um, and actually Northumberland and the Scottish borders are full of recusant uh, uh, Catholic houses. Um, I was talking to Joanna one day uh, about the house and about what we might do next season. And I just said, you know, I've done all this stuff on sound recording and voices and ghosts and souls and 
uncanniness and stuff. She said, oh, nice. And we got on talking and she started telling me all these stories about the house, uh, which she's an extremely rational woman. So when she tells me that there was a huge crash upstairs and a wardrobe that used to be in this room was now on the landing, um, I believe that that actually probably happened. Um, going upstairs to bed one night and finding a, a straight line of China ornaments laid out across their bedroom floor with only her and Simon living there. Um, so there's, it's a strange house. It doesn't have any evil atmosphere about it. It's very strange. Everyone goes like, oh, what a lovely feeling this place has. This has a real, feels very safe, very safe. something very nice about this place. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of spooky place already. So of course I got interested in this and started thinking, oh, we could do something where I could, you know, hide voices in the, the buildings or in the courtyard and stuff like that. It might be nice for people to come and just hear the sounds. It then occurred to me, of course, that having been a reticent house, this was essentially a place where, at least metaphorically, voices had been historically silenced. Uh, these people were excluded from public life in, 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 in many respects. And it was it coincided with uh, a great deal of the hysteria around Brexit and particularly the anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim hysteria in particular. And I thought it's quite interesting, it would be quite interesting to do a piece drawing attention to these lost voices of the recusancy and thinking about the violence, voices that were effectively being silenced or at least shouted down during that particular recent historical period. And of course, that is ongoing. So we decided we would do this, this project, and I was just going to do, you know, thinking, oh, well, maybe we could find, you know, are there any letters that are in the family archive that we could set to music or whatever? And then I remembered that my colleague, uh, Professor Magnus Williamson, who's one of the British experts on the late Renaissance, uh, late medieval early Renaissance, church music uh, had just got a huge AHRC grant for what's called the Tudor Park Books Project. And the Tudor Park Books Project was, um, there is a collection in Oxford uh, University called the Baldwin Park Books. And there's mostly six part uh, motets written at the end of the 16th century. They're mostly Marian anthems, so they're Catholic. Uh, so their performance at the time would have been highly restricted. And they're by some of the great and the good of uh, the, the late Tudor period. Unfortunately, Mr. Baldwin, who they're named after, uh, was a tenor. And his part books, the only one that didn't go back to the library, as it were, uh, when, when, when the, the part books were donated, <laughs> his copy was missing. So there's a whole tenor voice missing from these um, uh, uh, six part um, motets, many of which only exist in the Baldwin part books. They're not found anywhere else in any other source. So Magnus's Tudor Park Books project was a way, uh, a project to reconstruct what this, these lost voices, literally lost, mislaid voices, might have been. You see where I'm going with this. This is Magnus uh, looking like a, a guest in a, in a sort of horror story. Uh, this is the local newspaper's photograph of him with what's called the Peter Gradual. And the Peter family were a, a, a still are a family in Essex. Um, and this is, this is a, um, I believe it's a 14th century manuscript, but it's believed because the, the director of the private reticent chapel, because the Peters are also a reticent family, uh, was William Bird. And it's believed this is the book that Bird used to actually teach their choir uh, how to sing, and particularly how to elaborate and improvise an ornament upon the, the bare notes that they had in the, in the, the books in the, in the family library. And it turns out by a weird coincidence that I think is important, the Peter family are actually direct relatives of the Riddle family uh, in Northumberland. So from Essex to Northumberland, there is this family connection around these, um, this kind of material, this sort of late Tudor music. What we decided, Magnus and I worked together, and I decided I was going to make a sound installation the raw material of which was his reconstructed voices. So the lost voices brought back to life, brought back to life a second time by being recorded and then incorporated into what ended up as an eight channel, uh, 30 minute composition, which was installed in the courtyard uh, at, um, at Cheeseburn as, a, as a, an eight channel piece. 
This is um, part of the, there's a big courtyard. This is, these are the old um, uh, hunting kennels. Uh, they obviously at one time had a lot of hounds. This is the dovecot, uh, which of course was an important source of food in those days. And this is the, the tunnel that goes through into the garden. There's, the, there's another three doors on either side of this, this enormous courtyard. And so I had loudspeakers in six of the, uh, sorry, in five of the, the kennels, one in an old um, blacksmith's forge, which is off to the side, and then another couple uh, coming out through the, the dovecot halls there. So as you walked into, into the courtyard, there were voices coming from all directions, but more or less in a, in, a, in a large panorama. What I've got to give you a sense of what it sounds like, obviously, is very cramped. Uh, you get no sense of space or the fact that each of these voices was coming from a separate place. But I thought I'd just play you it just so you get an idea. tiny clip out of a 30 minute piece. So to conclude, I want to talk about now trying to put these um, isolated spots of historical things together into a kind of constellation. One of the problems with the idea of tradition is it's often assumed that a tradition is kind of linear. Uh, we have, you know, the great tradition of German classical music, you know, the jazz tradition, as though it was a singular thing. And this doesn't really seem to be how traditions really work. I think traditions are maybe more dendritic. Uh, they are maybe a confluence of many different uh, inputs, or as Deleuze and Guattari would call them, rhizomes, uh, things that have connections, but they have non-linear connections, they're very plural connections. Um, and so what I'm seeing in these formative TV programmes from, from my childhood, uh, are a series of imaginations of what the voice is, voice connected to recording as a kind of ensoulment, as a kind of model of metempsychosis, um, but also something uh, about the, um, the amazing newness of these technologies when they were first uh, being used on television in particular. And again, if you look at it's why I wanted to play the TV ident of HTV, that wobbly sort of synthesizer kind of thing. This is something that suddenly entered into popular culture, particularly, particularly in the 60s on television. Uh, Doctor Who, of course, is the, is the classic example, the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. And in this, one of the interesting ways of thinking about it is the concept of musical hauntology, which is a very complex term, actually. Mark Fisher, K-Punk. Uh, was the guy who really sort of appropriated from its original use by Derrida uh, in Spectres of Marx and talks about how um, in the depersonalized, alienated, ultra individualized 80s uh, and 90s, um, we have a resurgence of interest in the particularly the sounds and the technologies and the musics of that strange moment in, 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 in British culture in particular, where it seemed that things were getting better and that there was a future. And he talks about hauntology um, very movingly as a nostalgia for a progressive future that never happened. And that's what we're living right now. And so 
as a sort of symptom of that, a number of record, record labels, Ghost Box and The Year in the Country are two of my favourites. Um, they've produced a lot of music where they've sampled and reused um, the sounds of TV idents and, and sort of the, that, that effect early electronic music, particularly those sci-fi and ghost stories that were aimed at children, that were aimed at the early TV, early, early evening TV audiences. Uh, under the sort of musical style of hauntology. I don't think what I'm doing is hauntology, but I think that the tradition inside of which I'm working with, with Lost Voices is not unconnected uh, to my childhood experiences of seeing the Children of the Stones, the Stone Tape when I was a teenager, um, and another famous children's TV programme called The Owl Service. And about that, Stephen Prince, who's the owner of A Year in the Country and is also a uh, a blogger and a writer. He's not a very good writer, I'm afraid to say, but he says interesting things. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of time for him, but he's, he, his writing can be problematic. He says the opening credits to Alan Gardner's series, The Owl Service, is nearer to, say, a short artist film than something you would expect to find as the introductory section to a children's television series. And I haven't got time, I don't think, to play it, but it's a kind of early music, concrete kind of... Uh, Piece. I, don't, I haven't got time to play it, have I? Go on, give us, give us the long It's piece. 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds, here we go. As I said, uh, Stephen Price saying it's, it's more like a, an experimental artist's film than primetime children's TV. So I'm proposing that a plurality of traditions, thinking of traditions as rhizomatic, as, den and as dendritic, um, allows for ways into what we do in ways that broadly parallel what Lee was talking about yesterday um, and how, you know, music that's only, an only antithetical often only works for insiders. I think there's an awful lot of the sounds and the sensibilities that we're interested in uh, today uh, that allows for ways in and to conclude. I'm just going to say, I had a student, I play stuff to my first year students and I, I, I played them, I can't remember what it was, um, it was something head banging sort of, you know, noise drawn kind of thing and sort of say to them at the end, so what do you think of that? And everybody was really interested in what colour their shoes are. <laughs> but there was, um, there's a girl in the class um, called Jessica and she was always quite outspoken uh, and she was kind of confident and genuinely interested in asking questions. And so I said, come on, Jessica, you must have something to say about it. And she said, well, to be honest, Ben, I just don't get it. OK, how do I answer that? And I, I just said, that makes you sound really stupid. What if there's nothing to get? We assume there's something to get. What if there isn't anything to get? And I said, what are you going to do to make yourself sound cleverer? And she said, I don't know what to make of it. And what I'm suggesting is that that is a really useful way in. What do you make of it? And what I've been trying to do here is make something out of these disparate points of culture. I've been trying to make a tradition that allows a way in uh, to think about how we might do experimental music in, in all sorts of different places and situations. So we don't say, I don't get it. There's nothing to get. Don't know what to make of it. That opens the door to making something of it. Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating as always. Yeah. Does, does anyone have any um, questions for Bennett? Bennett. Yes. Um, you were talking about the voice as a series of illusions of anthems. 
Yeah, the the the, the, the father in the in the um in the the children of the stones was saying that to his son as they drove into Avery. Yes, that, that's the one. Absolutely. We're, we're really used to recorded voices, aren't we? We're very used to separated voices on the telephone and, and Teams and Zoom and the rest of it. But it's funny how this specific, isn't it? Mm. This idea of something mm. eerie about it. Yeah. Even now, it only needs to drift out of sync and it's already weird. Yeah, even, even a tiny yeah. little bit. Yeah. So that, that's, we're, we're not used to that. Mm. Even we might think we are. Um, well, I think it's not just that we're not, it's, 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 not, it's, 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 what do we make of it? You know, anything, anything that we experience, we, we, we turn, we turn into experiences, we make experiences of them as much as we, I don't believe we perceive things in a passive way. So, you know, we're, we're constantly making all sorts of sense, often at quite subconscious levels of things, you know. And we were talking about, um, Recontextualizing objects. I mean, yesterday he was talking about that in Marcel Duchamp and so on. And we're doing this all the time, aren't we? Mm. With recorded voices, mm. with some um, disembodied voices. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. Yeah, no, they, um, they, they, they come to inhabit other places, yeah. other, other, other things, other objects. Any, any questions for Bennett before we can do this? A remark. Yes, so uh, it makes me think of what was the reaction uh, for everyone when we first heard the human voice being recorded mm -hmm. and talking uh, first, uh, first recording. Yeah. yeah. Thomas yes. Edison said the voice has become, as it were, immortal. It was his first pronouncement on it in Scientific American in 1878. That idea of the immortal voice is there from the very beginning. Edison, of course, was obsessed with spiritualism. He tried to invent what he called soul batteries, these enormous uh, lead and copper batteries, which dying people's souls could be poured into so they would live forever. Um, it's crazy stuff, really crazy stuff. And I can think, of, for example, um, in my family, I have one of my uncles that refused to be taken a picture, a photograph, yeah. because he believes part of the soul would get mm -hmm. trapped the in there, and and then you can escape it, and you lose time of your life. So, yeah. so the voice also yeah. is it's so personal because yeah, uh, we live with it. Yeah, we hear it differently also in the recording yeah. because we hear ourselves through our head. Yeah, yeah. So that also has um, our, our nobody likes the sound of their own voice on yeah. the head. Yeah. No, it, it, it's because it's it's not us. We're in here. I'm never over there where you are. I hear my voice coming from over there where you are. There's a there's a there's a circuit broken uh, that you know has been there since I was born. Maybe arguably since before I was born. Gone. Let's give one more. Not a really question. This fascinating thought. Really, really inspiring. Makes it reflect a lot. I love the idea of plurality of traditions. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. So the same way as plurality of knowledge and plurality of traditions, that you can never a linear or circular. Mm -hmm. no. Much more, you know, the complex. Yeah. But I think about cage yesterday as well. So John Cage as well. So some way broke all the rules of Western traditional views. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it was really ground, you know, ancient traditions of teaching, you know, yeah. thinking. Mm -hmm. What is tradition is both yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's kind of circle yeah. layers of tradition, time space. Yeah. So yeah. It's very fascinating. And the deaf voice is a, is a, is a something kind of physical or ghost presence as well. Yeah. Um, I'm working in, you know, in a project with uh, indigenous community in Brazil. We're discussing this from their perspective. I have time to explain that, but anyway, and the way they perceive sounds are kind of Metaphysical communication between here, the physical experience and something yeah. you call spiritual, but there's actually spiritual, but it's something uh, is a kind of internet connection to mm. other. Yeah. And it's very fascinating how she sounds not just vibratory movements in the air, yeah. actually, memory or the resonance that you cannot explain. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm very aware that the concert is scheduled to start in about a minute. Oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Can we thank again Bennett and David for being here?